Um, so, so let me set up something that looks like this, and then um, and uh, talk through the things about the rolling without sleeping that um, that we need to uh, that that I feel like I need to lecture on. So, um, so it would look something like. I'm actually going to glue this to the ground so that it doesn't um, it doesn't move when the simulation runs. Um, so since this is simulation, I think I can illustrate this um, the idea of rolling without sleeping better this way. So imagine that you have some um, disk wheel thingy. So, so I, there's a very small gap there. When I start running the simulation, it's going to drop a very small distance. And then it'll hopefully just start rolling. That's a kind of normal thing that you are used to seeing. Um, so let me do that. I'm just going to run the simulation. Yeah, and it rolls down the incline. That's kind of what round the shape to things to do when you set them on something like this. Now, what I want to highlight is things that um, we don't, things that I tell you to neglect as much as you can, whenever you can, uh, friction. So this simulation by default sets a kind of a reasonable friction coefficient. So um, the way this was set up, it started out with this, with some amount of friction. So let's imagine um, what this uh, picture would have looked like if there actually was friction. Oh, sorry. A if there actually was no friction, if a friction was truly negligible in this interaction. Let's watch what happens. And this is quite... Um, unusual setup, you know, it's a sliding down without rolling. And in many physically reasonable scenarios, we wouldn't be asking you about um, uh, sliding without rolling. It's more common for us to ask you about rolling without sleeping condition. Uh, or uh, so it, we might give you a question like, um, so you have a ball that's at some top of an incline, you let go and it starts to roll without sleeping. Or there might be some, or I guess sometimes we might not even say without sleeping, well, well it just rolls. And oftentimes we would be assuming that it doesn't sleep. And in questions like that, unless you know what exact condition to use, um, it can be difficult because it'll feel like you have a missing bit of information you will have either used your conservation law or Newton's law analysis, and you'll have set up everything. And then when you're trying to solve, you have more unknowns than equations. So you can't quite solve it. And, and that would be because you are indeed missing a piece of information. And uh, let me just write out what that piece of information that you are missing often will be. So I, I hate to refer to formulas because um, in terms of physics problem solving, I think that's uh, kind of the, one of the least productive things that students do, you know, go hunting for formulas to plug in numbers into. Uh, but it does come down to when you, um, when you fully understand the rolling without sleeping condition. And what this condition amounts to is it is giving you license to use this particular set of formulas. And depending on your situation, depending on what equations you're setting up, uh, it might be one set of relationships versus the other set that's more useful, but they are all kind of interrelated to each other. And the relationships will be this. Um, if you are looking at something like a distance rolled, then distance rolled, you can relate it this way. Uh, so if this uh, round thing has radius r, the distance rolled would be the radius of the round thing 
times the angle theta or the amount of the angle the the angular displacement it has undergone so that's one relationship that might be useful or um, if you have something like speed of the center of mass if you have some translational speed of the body then you can relate that translational speed of the body to the angular speed of the body and that relationship would be the radius of the object times um, angular velocity of the object. And uh, last relationship that um, that might be useful is if you somehow know the or have know or have an expression for the linear acceleration of the body, acceleration of the center of mass of the body, then you can relate the acceleration of center of mass to uh, well the the radius of the round the object times the angular acceleration of the body and i hope you see the relationship between each of these three um, um, expressions the relationship here is uh, derivative so if you take the uh, this relationship for example um, uh, or you know x is equal to r uh, theta then you imagine take the time taking the time derivative of this equation left hand right hand side then left hand side time derivative of x gives you speed and on the right hand side r is a constant parameter and so it just passes through the derivative and when you have the time derivative of the angular displacement that is the angular velocity and when you take the time derivative of this expression that's what gets you to the uh, next expression derivative of velocity is acceleration derivative of angular velocity is angular acceleration and so so if you are able to justify any one of these expressions based on a good physical description of rolling without sleeping then you can get to any other two from uh, from having justified the one of the three expressions. So let me try to give a justification of uh, how, why the rolling without sleeping condition gives you license to use any one of these uh, three relationships. Um, it has to do with, um, let me see if I can demonstrate it this way. Um, or, mm, I'm, I think, uh, I don't think it, it really comes through all that well in the simulation itself. So, um, so I would ha have to ask you to imagine. <laughs> so imagine uh, looking at this point here. Um, you are looking at this point here and, um, and consider these three points. This point where the ball is touching the surface below. This point in the middle, which might even be called the center of mass, or uniform object like this. And uh, this point up here, that's, uh, I don't know, point three. These three points are moving at different speeds. Uh, well, uh, right now at the very beginning, um, it, it, they are all not moving, so it's not very good. Uh, so let me do this. I'm going to let the simulation run for a little bit and then stop. Um, so let me let the run this, let the simulation run for a bit. That is, uh, okay, okay. I need to do this with a slower speed so that I can stop it at the right. Um, I want to stop it when that just barely touches the. Okay, there. Okay, hang on. Uh, so let me move these labels over. So at this point now, the disk has a speed. So it is rolling with some speed. And that speed that we would uh, normally identify with would be this speed of the center of mass. So how fast this point is moving. It's moving, it has some speed. And what I want you to think about and consider is how the speeds here and the speeds here are different from speed of the center of mass. 
And really the most important point is here. This is the point. When we say something is rolling without sleeping, it must mean that this point here, it's not sliding. Because if this point is sliding either way, then it's sleeping. So when someone says something is rolling or rolling without sleeping, they are in kind of in many words, they are giving you this information that this point has velocity of zero. And, um, and when you have that, then you can imagine, um, so this uh, disc is, uh, um, it has a rather complicated motion. It's both uh, translating and rotating. It's doing both at the same time. So while its center of mass is moving at this speed, it's also angularly moving. Uh, it has some angular velocity. So with this um, constraint in mind, the center of mass is moving at some speed of center of mass. And this point is not moving. Its velocity is zero. I want you to try to imagine a real, uh, coming up with a relationship between this uh, angular velocity and this uh, speed of center of mass. And this is where a good understanding of how we define angles is really useful. So because we have a um, really special non-arbitrary unit of angle. Uh, I don't mean degrees. Degrees are totally, in, the, in fact, the word degree is a shorthand for this is an arbitrary unit system. It, it, that's why we are saying degree. It applies to degrees, 360 degrees. It applies to degrees Celsius. It's totally arbitrary. It applies to degrees Fahrenheit, totally arbitrary. With the Kelvin, you don't say degrees because it's not arbitrary. Um, so, when you have, I'm, I'm trying to draw a unit circle here. <laughs> so to illustrate our non-arbitrary unit of uh, non-arbitrary um, uh, angular measure. So this is something that you cover in geometry class, but I find that a lot of students forget, or maybe you are never told this. <laughs> different people have different geometry teachers. So you are used to, so let's say you have something quite uh, common and recognizable, like 90 degrees. And um, uh, maybe you remember enough of radians to know that if someone asks you, oh, what is this angle in radians? Then you know enough to say, oh, that's a pi over two radians. But suppose someone asks you, why? Why is it pi over two radian? Um, then oh, sometimes I get this answer. Oh, it's pi over two radian because 180 degree is equal to pi radian. Okay, <laughs> but again, I would ask you the question why? Because uh, with the degrees, um, it is an arbitrary unit. There's no reason or why. There's no reason or why why one full circle is a 360 degrees. It just is. Uh, I usually blame Babylonians, but maybe. Uh, anyways, so with a unit system like a degrees, I don't ask you why this is 90 degrees. It just is. But with a radian, because it is a non-arbitrary unit, there is an explanation. There is an explanation why this is pi over 2 radian and not, um, not pi radian. We can just double this and have everyone in the world agree that uh, this is, shall forever now be known as pi radian and the full circle will be four pi radian. That doesn't work because that goes against the rational and logic of the definition of radian. And this is how radian is defined. Uh, radian can be defined using a unit circle or it can be defined using a circle of radius r. And radian is a, um, radian is a way to measure angle by measuring distance. Because distance measurements are not arbitrary. Distance, you know, you have physical object, you can put a ruler to it and measure distance. 
It's not arbitrary. So radian is a un, uh, angular unit system that's designed to measure how much this angle is to measure by measuring distance. So in a circle, you think about what other quantity varies as you change this angle. And some person, uh, some observant person thought through this and realized, hmm, the arc length changes. And in fact, how long an arc length is, it seems to be proportional to this angle. So we can define this angle by doing this. We can take the arc length. And um, now, everywhere except for the unicircle, you can't just say the arc length is the angular measure because um, you could also have a bigger circle. So if you have a bigger circle of uh, radius 2r, then even though this is the same angle, this arc length is now longer. So you can't just take the arc length, but if you take the arc length and divide it by r, this is a quantity that only depends on how large this angle is and no other parameters. If you have a larger circle, both the arc length and radius will increase uh, by the same factor so that those same factors will cancel out. So this ratio of the length, that's how unit of radian is defined. It uses this ratio of two lengths to define this angle. And that's why one full circle is 2 pi radian because uh, the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. So when you take 2 pi r, divide out r, you get 2 pi. And <laughs> so until we change the definition of pi, the one full circle has to be 2 pi. It can't be any other value. And uh, so radian is actually, because it's defined this way, it's not a real unit. As in, you can, when you see it in your uh, system of units, like, you know, omega, sometimes we call it uh, radians per second. But from time to time, you might see people referring to unit of omega as being just an inverse second. And they are both right. It's because the radian is not a real unit. It's just the ratio of length. It's a unitless quantity. Uh, we say the word radian when we want to remind ourselves, other people, that we are measuring an angular quantity with that unitless number. But that unitless <laughs> unit of radian is defined through this ratio in a very non-arbitrary way. Now, when you realize all this, then you can see that um, there's a really uh, tight uh, connection between the angle and the arc length. This arc length here, as long as you specify your angle in radian, the arc length will be the angle times the radius. So in this context here, what we would mean is, so if we want this point not to move, then as this moves at VCM, this would have to rotate at angular velocity that um, matches this uh, relationship. The radius times the angular velocity would have to match the center of mass. So that in some amount of time, in the time that it takes at this point to move a little bit, it will also rotate by the right amount, right amount of theta, so that this point doesn't move. And once you figure out that much, that velocity here is zero, according to this, uh, at this point, it moves at a VCM. At this top point, it moves at OE. It moves at exactly two VCM. So, so that's the uh, geometry that you have when you have a rolling without slipping condition. And um, and here, when I let the simulation run, you kind of see that. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me try to make it run even slower. As it rolls without slipping, you see, okay, so this point hasn't moved at all. This point moved a little bit. That uh, kind of matches r times uh, theta, uh, whatever this theta is. And then the point at the top, it's moved the most. So I, I guess I'm, <laughs> I've just, without warning, I've shifted my point of uh, rotation reference to down here so that this is at r, this is at 2r. 
And given the same angular change, uh, this is moved some arc length, and this moves some double that arc length. So, um, and but this a point of contact that doesn't move; it keeps shifting. That's uh, how it um, does roll and actually does move. Um, it, but the, wherever it happens to be touching, at that point, that at that moment, its instantaneous velocity is zero. It's not moving. That's what rolling without slipping means.